Well, I think Philip Green was said that ladies and gentlemen was a bit too uh, formal, so I'll just say Kylie Leenid, dear friends in uh, Icelandic, and to say that uh, it's really delightful to be back in Shetland and it's so nice to be at another St. Magnus conference which uh, bodes to be uh, just as great as the first one. And I do realise that I'm what stands between you and the pub, or perhaps the museum, so I appreciate you all staying the course. Um, yes, so my interest in uh, climate change and climate history does lead me off in different directions, and one of them is uh, fisheries history. And uh, really, the work I'm going to be talking about is something that I, I looked at quite a while ago, but I've got a brand new project, and the, the acronym is Green Ice, and the actual title is Impacts of Sea Ice and Snow Cover Changes on Climate, Green Growth, and Society. And this is a project that's just been uh, funded by um, Nordforsk, a uh, Nordic uh, research um, funding body. And it's led by uh, Professor Noel Kingleyside in Bergen, and he's a climate modeler and sea ice modeler and together with 11 other people who are on the project from different countries. But there are two of us who are more on the social science and humanities side, uh, Neil Sangerson and myself. And having this project is um, going to give me a, a chance to do a little bit more work on this uh, fisheries stuff. So um, I don't know if you can read that, but basically the project is about um, looking at predictions of sea ice changes and climate changes, um, but we're also looking at um, coastal communities in Iceland, Norway, and Greenland, and that's a contemporary focus, but we're also doing um, a, a little bit more of a, 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 an historical study. And uh, I know you shouldn't kind of borrow other people's quotes, but I just happened to find this, and I just thought it was rather nice, but the Icelandic economy being an extremely fishy one, and I think that's quite true. About 70% of the country's foreign earnings do derive from fish exports, but um, um, only a small percentage of the workforce is actually involved in the, in the industry. But perhaps with the, all, the, all the connections with the economic crash and so on, it does have a bit, bit of a fishy basis. So for our... Um, uh, kind of contemporary focus. We're looking at, um, as I mentioned, some uh, local coastal communities. And for Iceland, we're going to be looking at Husavik and Bognafjörður. But we're also going to be undertaking a bit of a, an historical ecological study, highlighting past changes, uh, in particular with regard to fisheries, uh, a little bit in the context of changes in sea ice incidents, but uh, hoping to illuminate present and possible future changes by looking at these um, past uh, practices and so on. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, then here is uh, a picture of landing cod with a nice uh, boat, um, probably in the early, early 1800s. So just a bit of uh, historical background, and I think when we think of Iceland, we do think about fisheries, but, but the fishing uh, uh, economy, part of the economy, uh, really didn't become um, a major industry until the late 19th century, and it wasn't very much uh, a separate activity from farming, which was the most important thing. But fish was always important too, and an important part of the diet and exports. And uh, a great variety of fish were caught, um, uh, herring a little bit, uh, haddock, halibut, lumpfish, and also sharks. Um, ice, modern Icelanders definitely prefer haddock to, um, to um, cod, and uh, so I just thought I'd put a picture of a haddock, but of course, what I'm gonna be talking about mainly is cod. Um, now, something important to remember is uh, cod and water temperature. Cod is a cold water fish. Temperatures of up to of four to seven degrees Celsius are kind of optimal. And its northern limit, um, the distri distribution is restricted to waters with temperatures above two degrees centigrade. So obviously changes in water temperatures are going to be very 
important for what's going on. Um, just to say a little bit about the historical sources, because that's what I work with, uh, documentary records. And um, I don't need to introduce dear Snolly to this audience, <coughs> but um, in his Edda, he, uh, he has this wonderful list of, of fish, and he gives 56 names of different fish, and um, 26 of these species have the same name as in modern Icelandic, and I, I think that's interesting. Um, many treatises were written on um, fish and fisheries um, from really quite early on, and this is this is one that had some very very beautiful illustrations. Uh, these are by Egert Olafsson, who might be termed Iceland's first naturalist, and this is from a book um, uh, in the English translation, Travels in Iceland, which uh, he did together with Bjarni Paulsson. Uh, going traveling around Iceland in the 1750s, uh, really at the behest of the Danish government. And of course, as you all know, Iceland was governed by Denmark for, um, for a long time. Um, so the major docu documentary sources that I've been using, though, are uh, the later Icelandic annals, accounts by travelers and local Icelanders, some early newspapers, diaries, and letters. But in particular, I've been using these um, official reports to the Danish government, and that's what you see in the background of the slide there. Um, and they were, these are just uh, amazing sources. They're unpublished, um, they're in the uh, National Archives. And they begin about 1700, and they go through to about um, uh, 1890. And these are uh, reports, letters written to the um, authorities in Denmark by local officials in all the different counties of Iceland, of which there are about 22. And they give um, information on just about everything, um, weather, sea ice, trade, health, fisheries. So they're just amazing sources. and. Um, um, and I'm trying really hard to write a book about them, but I've used them a lot for different um, analyses. Um, I'm not going to talk about the archaeological record, but I want you to know that it's there. And, uh, and as you might gather, you know, bones are found from the settlement onwards. And, um, you know, and then there's a pattern of, of bones. Um, the pattern found here shown in red uh, indicates that trade was going on from very early times. And, and just very recently, there was an archaeological study which um, uh, suggests um, also that um, um, the, uh, you know, that the, uh, the, the cog declined a little bit, which is something I'm going to talk about in a minute. So, um, of course, uh, an important thing to think about is the, the fertility in the Icelandic waters. Um, arising from winter convection, bringing nutrients to the surface, and, and so on. So, a bit, bit more background. The main fishing grounds, um, the most important ones, were in the south of the Westman Islands, and in the west of Snipel's Ness. And uh, the arrows point to those places. Um, and uh, this is a bit more of a modern map, in a way, but it shows all the different um, fishing grounds. Um, the choice of the fishing grounds and the appointed fishing seasons obviously reflect the movement primarily of the, the cod during the year. And uh, here on this little map you can see uh, these crucial aspects, the currents, the colder currents in the north and the, the warmer Herminger current in the south and the, the drift of the, of the cod around the coast. So. Um, the main fishing season um, in the south tended to be in the winter from January and then on to May, and, um, and in the southwest from February to May. In the west there were two seasons, an autumn season and a spring season. And in the north and east, uh, the time for fishing was mainly in the summer and autumn, and that, that often meant a clash with getting the harvest in. So that could be a bit of a problem, and it meant that fishing was a bit less important. 
and shark fishing was important only in the north and west, but uh, we're not going to talk about sharks today. Um, so clearly from early settlement times, fish was important, and from the 14th century onwards, it was, um, it was the most important export item, and again in the form of dried cod. And I just noticed before I started that uh, I've got the date wrong here. The Danish trading monopoly was actually from 1602 to um, 1787. So I have no idea why I put that date in, but my apologies. Um, so the Danes had this trading monopoly and they controlled the trade. Um, and that caused a lot of um, hardship and um, misery, really, uh, to the Icelanders a lot of the time. But also after that time, Denmark was Iceland's main trading partner. Um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, rather nice quotation, and I've got some more, from this chap called Consul Crow, who was a British consul who was, who was stationed in Iceland in the late 1800s. And he wrote a, a treatise on uh, fish and fisheries, but I think this is now rather nice. He says, much of the best quality fish was exported to Bilbao and Barcelona, where the Iceland dried cod is much esteemed. The inferior qualities are shipped to England and Denmark. You're meant to laugh at that point. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, success and failure. The sources suggest that sea fishing was generally successful during the medieval period and well into the 16th century. But um, later on, in the 17th through the 18th centuries, the fisheries failed on numerous occasions, and catches in the 18th century in particular appear to have declined <coughs> sharply. And um, according to one source, in the mid 17th century, in the south of Iceland, one man would have been expected to catch, on average, about 500 cod during the winter fishing season, but after the mid 18th century, about 300 was regarded as the maximum. And apparently exports also declined, and uh, there are a lot of um, descriptions of this. Um, here's an account from 1747, and this is from one of these um, local officials, or a sheriff, um, uh, one of these reports that were sent to Denmark. He says, in the West, the fishing was poor, there were average to small catches of lumpfish, but everywhere the cod catch was the worst that people could remember for years, both during autumn fishing and the spring. In most places, most boats did not catch more than about 10 fish, and in many places, less. So I've used these um, uh, government reports to Denmark to look at fisheries catches for all of Iceland for the period from around 1680 to about 1780. And they, they suggest very clearly that fishing seemed to be about poor, seemed to be very poor during this time, except during the 1720s. Um, here's a little list from, um, just compiled from some of the accounts um, in the north of Iceland, as you can see, for all these years, it, it says that basically the fisheries were very poor. Um, so in the you know in in recent times we know a lot about correlations between climate and ocean temperatures and so on. You know we know that um, in the early 20th, 20th century there was a, a tremendous increase in um, different uh, fish stocks uh, around the uh, coast of Iceland, which uh, really helped to um, uh, secure Iceland's economic prosperity. Tremendous changes. Um, so, you know, maybe we can uh, draw some conclusions um, on past events. So, just to reiterate again, uh, when this period was of uh, poor fisheries between about 1680 and 1760, but climatic conditions were also rather severe during this time. Um, poor fishing was often associated uh, in the minds of contemporaries with the presence of sea ice. And uh, as you probably know, um, sea ice is a very important part, a com important component of the climate of Iceland because it drifts down on the, on the uh, East Greenland current 
and uh, reaches the shores, well, not very much at the moment with a lack of ice, but in the past it was, uh, it was really bad news because it would lower temperatures on land, which affected the grass crop, and it meant people couldn't go out fishing and, um, and trading vessels couldn't land. So, as I say, very much bad news. And here, a um, couple of um, accounts where the sheriffs say that uh, the fishing was bad because of the ice. Um, and another account for 1816, which was the famous year without a summer, um, it says the fishing stopped due to encroaching drift ice. But the good news about sea ice was when whales and other mammals, marine mammals, were washed up because that helped the food supply. Um, <clears throat> that account that I mentioned earlier by um, Egid Olofsson, Iceland's perhaps earliest naturalist, um, in, in their work, the Olofsson Pelson work, um, they talk about the, the cod being close to the ice, so that's kind of a different perspective, and I'm not sure what to say about that, except um, um, it's an interesting uh, kind of relationship to, to investigate further. So just to say a little bit about other factors <coughs> like boats, um, the Icelanders only had small open rowing boats, and there were numerous shipwrecks and loss of life. Uh, this is uh, another quotation from Consul Crow. He <coughs> says, the Icelander is an excellent mariner. His power of endurance, courage, and ability to keep the sea in all weathers is above praise, but his recklessness as to the soundness of the craft he trusts his life to is equally remarkable. Um, and then another, another factor, uh, kind of connections between fisheries and disease in the sense that um, there was a, a great smallpox epidemic in 1707-8, and this actually wiped out a third of the population. And this had a, a significant impact on the fisheries, um, and that's because people living in the coastal regions had a lot of difficulty finding uh, enough people to man the boats. Um, and it also meant that smaller boats had to be built. Um, in the 17th century, boats with 10 or 12 boats <coughs> were most usual, but boats for six or fewer men came into use before the middle of the 18th century. And this, apart from anything else, would mean smaller catches. Um, here's another account from um, the sheriff of Hunavatn, Sisla, in the north. Instead of the usual 14 or 15 boats from Olasvik, only two could be manned this year because of the lack of labor. Many people who live by the coast have left, and the people who live further inland do not want to risk setting out to fish because of the recent failure of the fishing. So there are all these kind of complicating factors. If fish disappeared from the fishing grounds, people who had lived there and they were dependent on fishing, they had to leave and try something else. And then uh, we've heard about the Dutch earlier, so here are the naughty Dutch again. Um, so it's, uh, a lot of uh, contemporary accounts uh, complain about the Dutch fishing in their waters, but, um, but I can't see that they would have made all that much difference, really. I mean, it's not like they were fishing in the way modern fisheries <coughs> done. So perhaps another possible explanation of poor fishing catches is a real decline in, in the stocks due to climate, um, more specifically sea temperatures and ocean currents. Um, it's possible that during a cold period, as in the 18th century, the range of cod could have withdrawn southward. And then we had a lot of sea ice coming to the coasts, and that would have had a negative impact. Uh, both because of its um, uh, effect of lowering, lowering temperatures on land and then preventing people from going out fishing. So based on uh, some of these documentary records, mainly the sheriff's uh, records and the later Icelandic annals, I put together a, a sea ice index. So we do have something that we can um, in time, or I can in time, compare the fisheries catches a little bit more closely with. But to summarize, um, 
there's no doubt that catches off the coast of Iceland very greatly, and they did decline to low levels at certain times. Um, the years between about 1680 and 1760 were mainly poor for fishing, and uh, obviously there were socio-economic factors involved, but ocean conditions uh, such as temperature and the sea ice must also have played a part, and um, we need a bit more further research. So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions for us? Oh, a rush of questions. Right, David, you were first. Um, yeah, just go back to your point about the Dutch fishing. I was wondering about that. If there was, is there some evidence of that in the late 16th century? I'm thinking of Shetland and the impact of Dutch mm -hmm. and Northwest German um, trade on that. It was, it was pretty significant, and also in places like Stornoway, the Western Isles, mm -hmm. it, it transformed the town in many ways. But with, is your evidence is very much that that was quite minimal then and it didn't have a particular effect. And is that because the Danes had a kind of stranglehold over the yeah, Icelandic Danes, fishing, even before these reports? The here? Danes did have a stranglehold. And, um, and as I said, there were a lot of complaints. They seemed to be a bit of a scapegoat amongst uh, you know, contemporaries. But from what I've read, um, it didn't, probably didn't have that much of an effect. But again, it would be interesting to do a bit more research. Thank you. So, I was going to say basically the same thing. I mm -hmm. think the, the Dutch fleet in Shannon waters was sometimes yes. very many thousands of boats, and they weren't very big, but they could take an awful lot of fish out of the sea in aggregate. They operated as a national fleet protected by frigates. Right. If they turned up, they could potentially strip, strip the oceans locally for a while. I don't think it was anything like that. Uh, Astrid, the, the southern Iceland uh, fishery, the, which was a winter fishery, has always amazed me as an example of really extreme fishing. You know? And I wondered, what was the social framework for that? Where was the fish going after they were caught? Were they being used to pay rents or, you know, uh, what was it being done for, essentially? Well, it was, you know, it was being done for, for the export by, by the Danish merchants. So they were being sold directly to merchants by the yes. fishing people? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and of course, um, they, they had no choice really in uh, regulating price or anything. That would all have been established by the, the merchant. You know, they had a captive audience, as it were. I uh, was wondering about your current project and how you uh, are going to take this information and apply it to the future. Is that what it's about? You know, I think um, it's it's really important to um, to know something about the, the context. Um, uh, you know, in order to be able to say something meaningful about the present and you know, and indeed the future. So I think it makes a lot of sense to. Uh, you know, it's going to be a fairly small part of, of this project, but uh, but to be able to trace the, the history of, of the fisheries in these local communities and, you know, seeing what's happening now, with tremendous changes, um, I, think, I think it's just so valuable to know something about, you know, how we've got where we are now. This is uh, probably going to be a naive, competent question. I know very little about the, the uh, 17th and 18th century uh, Icelandic fishery, about what you're talking about. But in the medieval fishery, of course, one of the big debates is the degree to which the land holding uh, the, the classes were willing to release labor for the fisheries, and that that was a critical inhibiting factor and, uh, on production. And, and I, I'm just wondering about, in terms of source criticism, about the, the degree to which the, the sources are, um, are are reflecting the accurately the situation on the ground, or whether there are underlying social tensions that they might be um, that you know that might not be visible in those official accounts that have to do with the way, particularly in the wake of smallpox epidemic, obviously 
uh, about the willingness of uh, uh, farmers to release labor for this activity, which might be then, you know, actually described in other ways in the official accounts. Yes. Um, I don't know anybody who's more critical of their sources than I am. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the thing is, there's such an abundance of sources, so it's very easy to compare, you know, what different people say. Um, and there are so many different genres of sources for this period. So uh, I don't see that as, as a problem. But you're right in that even uh, up, up to this point, there is a, uh, an effort uh, really to keep people more on the land. And you know, as I said, fisheries didn't become the big thing until uh, you know, much more recent times. Thank you. So what's the population of ice uh, jokes in um, let's say roughly 50,000, you know, which vary quite a bit. And entirely dispersed or was...? Very much dispersed. There were no towns as such, or not even villages. And the fishing stations were a bit temporary to some of them. Any final questions for us? Well, in that case, I think we'd like to thank you once again, Astrid, for the fascinating Thank you.